Okay, and here's your Here's today's expert, uh, Chris Martin. He has had over 25 years of experience in the embedded and SOC industry. Um, today he works for ARM. Uh, he makes the processors that are present in our SOCs. Um, he has worked on software design and verification teams during his career. Currently he serves as the senior manager of the North American Specialist FAE team for ARM, and he also serves as an individual contributor as the specialist FAE for software and debug tools for North America. So um, as part of his job, he helps customers with ARM DS every day, and he's here to share some of that knowledge with us. Okay, and with that, I will turn it over to Chris and he'll start sharing his screen. All right. Thanks, Susanna, and thanks everybody for joining today. So give me one moment as I share my screen. Okay, let me know if you can see my screen. We can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so as Susanna mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, ARM Development Studio and how it can connect up to and uh, help debug uh, Intel uh, SOC FPGA devices that have ARM um, cores in them. Uh, the session is broken up into a couple of different uh, sections. I'm just going to kind of give an overview of ARM Development Studio itself, um, some of the, the features that the Intel SOC FPGA edition has. I'll also include those. Um, in addition to the IDE itself, <coughs> Uh, Development Studio also includes a, a couple of other tools, including uh, the ARM compiler. Uh, one of those is uh, Streamline, which is one of our performance analysis tools. I'll just touch upon that. Uh, and then I have a, a small section on automating because uh, a lot of times you might not just want to debug, but you might also want to uh, integrate this in with uh, continuous integration or regression tests. I also have a live demo uh, to show uh, uh, Development Studio connected up to uh, an Intel SOC FPGA, it's a Cyclone 5 um, hard processor system, uh, and we have left some room for Q&A at the end. Okay, with that, I know there's a lot on this slide, but basically this sums up ARM Development Studio uh, in its entirety. So the blue section up above, this basically is Development Studio and what it is from a 50,000 foot view. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an IDE that allows you to build code and debug code. Uh, we've plugged in an, an ARM um, debug backend to Eclipse. So DS is based on Eclipse, and we have a, a debugger that will recognize ARM cores and, and, and GPUs from ARM as well and help debug those. Uh, and then this is a small thumbnail. I'll blow this up here in a minute of the performance and that analyzer streamline. Um, the white section down here are basically the cores <coughs> or devices that ARM Development Studio can connect to. So it can connect to models or emulators. So we have um, models from ARM that uh, model the CPU. You can connect up to those. Those run on the PCs that uh, run DS. <coughs> we also work with a, a lot of the emulation companies. You connect up to emulators. Um, you can connect up to real world hardware and boards with uh, several different probes. Here I'm showing uh, an Intel FPGA download cable. Um, the board that I'm using, and we'll see in a minute, doesn't use this because um, one of the good things about the <clears throat> Intel FPGA boards, if I can bear with me a minute, I'm losing my voice. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, many of the boards actually have an embedded Intel FPGA download cable on the device. You don't actually have to have a separate separate cable other than a normal USB cable. And of course, I'm showing a couple of different ARM probes, and uh, including our DStream, which is our high end, and our U-Link, which is mostly for microcontrollers. You can also connect up to um, Linux applications that are running in user space <clears throat> that are running um, on the boards um, through GDB <clears throat> in TCP IP. Uh, and then we've also enabled um, some of the devices out there today can actually encapsulate debug information and not send it over JTAG, but send it over functional IO such as USB, PCIe, and Ethernet. But that's only if the devices have um, some ARM IP on there to, to, to do that, but that functionality does exist. 
Okay, let's push it. Um, uh, I touched upon this a little bit, but basically what ARM does is we've taken a couple of things from the open source community, Eclipse and the LLVM compiler, and augmented them. Uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on all of these different bubbles so we can get to the Q&A, and hopefully my voice will stay with me for that too. But uh, basically what you get on top of the open source tools are a couple of different things. Um, you get integrated ARM and Intel support. Um, you, you basically get um, the latest support for the latest um, ARM cores if you're using um, the, uh, the high-end um, non-Intel SOC FPGA edition. And of course, you get to, to contact ARM support instead of going to an open source community to get uh, support if you have an issue with uh, any of our tools. And that's the same for the, uh, the ARM compiler as well. Um, so I've mentioned several different versions of Development Studio, but how does the Intel SOC FPGA edition fit into that? Um, so, so basically what we've done is we've worked with Intel to, to bundle up everything you need to debug the cores that are in their devices. And currently they're using uh, a set of cores from um, the ARM v7 line, which is an A9, and the ARM v8 line, which is the A53. And so we've enabled debug, and these icons here mean that you can debug, and the gears mean that you can compile and use the ARM compiler with that license to compile for these targets. Um, the other additions basically are just licensed a little, um, they are enabled with a license that uh, enable you to use just different cores. Um, the high end basically is gold and allows you to use um, the functional safety version of the ARM compiler. And then our, our platinum version, don't have to go into too much detail there, but um, it's basically used for um, our silicon partners that are using cores that haven't quite been released yet. But that's how um, the Intel SSC FPGA edition fits into this. Um, to dive in a little bit of the details of that, um, so you can debug um, the A9s that are in the Cyclone 5, the ARIA 5, or the ARIA 10, um, as well as the A53 that are currently in the Agilex and Stratix 10 devices. Um, again, I mentioned uh, it, we ha it includes um, the ability to connect up natively to the Intel FPGA download cable, and uh, no need to purchase like an extra, extra Pro, but a lot of times you may have these that will connect up to the board or the boards themselves will have it. Um, the IDE will use compilers. Uh, a couple of things I do wanna mention, the ARM compiler version six, and that's the latest version, uh, comes pre-installed with, uh, with DS, um, but you can plug in other compilers as well. So you can uh, um, basically uh, install an earlier version, version five or earlier, and uh, point the, 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 uh, the device or the uh, DS to it as well as GCC and LLVM compilers, you can actually do the same thing. And so that way it will natively know about these. All right, uh, a little bit more about Development Studio before we get into demo. Um, this is kind of a preview of, of some things you may see in the demo coming up. Um, <clears throat> uh, but basically, uh, in, in a single window, you can debug multiple cores and even multiple devices and multiple boards at the same time. You can click on each one of these cores and the context of what's happening in those cores changes. For example, um, if you click on a different, in this example here, an A76 versus an A55, um, the memory windows change. So this would be what the, the, the current core is selected to see. Um, what's not shown as registers, but the CPU registers change. Um, how the uh, the call stack is um, currently on each one of those cores, as well as the uh, the trace um, um, information as well. All of these will update per core. And if um, you're running an OS, uh, DS is aware of several different OSs natively as well, uh, including Linux and and some other RTOSs that you may have recognized, like Free RTOS or ThreadX. Um, in addition to this, and we've we've worked with several partners um, to do this, we we open sourced our API for building, um, you know, enabling a custom OS to be aware with or allow DS to be aware of that custom OS. So you can build your own OS awareness into the tool itself. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can uh, basically simultaneously debug multiple cores, multiple chips, multiple boards, all at the same time. This is just kind of highlighting this a little bit. 
Um, so you could be running bare metal applications uh, in addition to running Linux applications or the Linux kernel as well. Um, so you can connect up to bare metal um, and the Linux kernel through a JTAG um, a probe and trace probe. You can also connect up to user space applications using um, GDB, or if you're uh, debugging an Android voice, you can use a uh, device, you can use uh, ADB. And these can happen at the same time. So that way, if you're running, say, like a Linux application in user space, you can see what it's doing and how that affects the, the kernel as well. Okay, I'm going to touch a little bit onto the Streamline Performance Analyzer. Uh, I, again, uh, this is some, some thumbnails um, that you'll see. I, I don't have a demo of this later on, but uh, I do want to touch upon this because it is a tool that, that comes with, um, with the, the download install and it's licensed with DS. Uh, but basically what this allows you to do is to connect up to targets and see what's running on that device and that CPU um, and, and glean more information than you would with just debug information or trace information basically just tells you a little bit of what happened and when it happened. Um, but the performance analysis will tell you what happened way back in time as well as how much happened. So you can see some bandwidth numbers as well. Um, it is basically a whole system analyzer, not just the CPU. So we're able to, to analyze the CPU, uh, any of the ARM GPUs that may be in the device. Um, we actually have a probe that you can connect onto the board and probe up to 40 uh, voltage and, uh, and current lines as well. Um, and it knows about OpenCL. So if you have any OpenCL kernels running on the GPU or the CPU, um, it'll visualize what's happening in those kernels as well. And uh, what's not shown here, because it's just a static image, but these uh, views update in time as the code is running. So just kind of see this, um, all of your charts um, update and, and flow, and you can get some information from that based on where maybe the bottlenecks are and dig down into the code and find these, these red or hot spots. And then this is just an example since um, the, the high-end um, SS, uh, SSE FPJs have Cortex A53s in them. Some of the um, performance monitor counters, as we call them at ARM, um, some of the information that you can glean out of that device. And here I was just highlighting some L1 and L2 cache um, uh, information uh, or counters, but um, it also will take a look at um, the execution pipeline as well and see what instructions happen, if any stalls happened, um, and then even go past the cache and see if any memory accesses um, or external bus accesses were, were happening as well. So you can get a, a get a sense of how many accesses happen and take a look at um, um, what the bandwidth is there. So that's streamlined as a, as a very high high level view. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit before we get into the demo um, to just automating uh, development studio. So there's a couple of things that I want to touch upon just three slides before we get into the demo here. Uh, and one is is semi hosting, so it's not um, automation by itself, but it's it's something that is used quite often when you're bringing up a new device, and the um, you, you may not have all of your device drivers uh, implemented, such as uh, drivers for UARTs or a way to display information um, like on a console. Uh, what this allows you to do is is make use of the JTAG probe and the debugger. And basically, we, inside of um, both the, the um, GNU standard C library and the, the ARM compiler um, standard C library, it has um, encapsulated all of the low level read, write, and sysio functions to allow you to do things like um, do a printf, uh, actually read and write files up through the JTAG, through the IDE to files. On, uh, on the PC that's running DS, as well as displaying that information in a console in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the window inside of, uh, inside of Development Studio. Um, so basically, this allows you to, to implement some, some debug code very early on when maybe not all of the software or firmware is, is implemented. You can make use of this and get some information quickly. Uh, in addition to that, um, we we uh, or DS enables several different uh, scripting languages. Uh, there's a proprietary language just called DS Script. 
um, which um, when you're running commands and connecting up to a target, you'll see what those um, commands are that are running in the background. You can actually highlight these and save these off to a script and play them back later. Um, if you need a little bit more or actually a lot more functionality, you can implement um, um, the connection to the target and automation with uh, with Python, and that allows you to do a lot of other things like uh, like um, read write memory locations, read write CPU registers, um, and in addition to 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 really writing an algorithm and wrapping it with loops that you may want to do. Um, in addition to that, this is just uh, highlighting the fact that uh, if you start typing in commands directly into into um, DS, there's actually some context help in here. But the, the real main uh, part of this is that there's embedded documentation in each one of those commands, and you can use those to build up scripts. Then the, uh, the final thing I want to touch upon for automation is being able to run the ARM Development Studio uh, from the command line, so use it without the GUI. Um, at all, and this allows you to to you know take all that automation, your scripts, um, to to connect to the target, um, download code, uh, set up a a set of um, a, a regression set uh, um, of uh, tests around it. This this can all allow you to do that um, um, automatically. So this will integrate very well in with the continuous integration we see that used um, all the time, especially when you you not necessarily have the end silicon or the board, but you may want to also automate this with em emulators as well. So just automate uh, connecting up to the emulator or the board and, and run your test. Okay, so that's what I have for a high level view of Development Studio and Streamline. Um, I do have a little bit of a live demo of Development Studio connected up to a, uh, a DE1 SOC uh, FPGA platform. Um, so this has a Cyclone 5 uh, dual core. Um, well, what's in it is a dual core A9 in the hard processor system or the HPS. Uh, and here I'm just showing some of the connections that, I, that I'm using when I have this board and this, this board sitting right here next to me. Uh, but basically I'm just uh, connected up to the USB JTAG. So this is that embedded um, download cable on, on the board. Uh, I'm also using the HPS UART. Uh, so I'm just using another USB cable to directly to my, uh, my PC. Um, and I'm not using it today, but uh, I do have it plugged in in case there's some questions, but I do have an ethernet cable. And this is useful if you boot the device up to, to Linux, you can actually talk to the device uh, through Ethernet as well. So with that, let me run through a, a quick demo real fast. Bear with me while I bring Development Studio over to the screen. So here we have Development Studio, and I'm going to show a couple of different things. Um, right now, inside of Development Studio, there's a view called Terminal. Um, you can use PuTTY. I, I do that quite often as well, but sometimes, and especially in this demo case, when I want to show everything in one screen, uh, it's good to know that there is a, uh, a terminal where you can use a serial connection or, or um, secure shell to the device. And I'm just going to now, it's connected up to COM4, which is the uh, HPS UART. I'm just going to turn it on. And here we see it's booting through U-Boot. And I'm going to stop it right there so I can run some other code and show you downloading code. Um, what I have next is before this, um, this session, I have built a simple Hello World uh, application that you can see here is going to be very, very simple. I'll bring up this code. It basically is just main and says hello world. Um, and we can show how to actually how to how to build this up from scratch here in just a moment. But I want to show you before anything else what happens when you actually connect up to this and download the code. Okay, so now it's uh, connected up to the uh, download cable um, and it's downloaded the code. Um, and it's basically sitting at, let me step once, sitting at um, 
the entry point of the SCOTUS running on the uh, the on-ship RAM that's in the F uh, the uh, HPS at uh, address all F or FFFF and all zeros. Um, and it when I set this up, I, I told it not to run to main, but it said to just run from the entry point. Um, but I have a couple of breakpoints already set in here. Um, but to set breakpoints, this is what you can do. Just double click here. So the breakpoint of main, I'm going to run to main. Um, this is showing the disassembly view of what's happening. I've enabled trace, which will show you what has happened before you even got to main. And basically what it's doing is doing all the C setup to initialize variables and uh, and clear out any of the, uh, um, the BSS um, data that's sitting in the device. And here I'm making use also of uh, the semi hosting. So, I, you know, here the code is just put S or put string. Um, no extra library functions that I had to write or anything and immediately it'll, it'll output to the app console. And you can see how it, it changed with, with the trace. You can see here, yeah, put S is taking a little bit of time here as long with um, flush and buffers. Okay, but this is the end result, but how did I get here? I was going to disconnect for this and kind of show you a couple of different things. So if you need to create a connection to the device from scratch, what you can do is click on run debug configurations. And what I'm going to do is just double click on this generic ARM CC++ application, and it's going to create a new connection for me. Going to name it um, yeah, DE1 SOC. Uh, I'll just call it Cyclify SV, or CB. Uh, but then I need to make sure I, I connect to the right device. So what I'm going to do is find the Intel SOC FPGA section. I'm going to select the dual core Cyclone 5, doing bare metal. Um, I'm going to connect it to both cores, and then you have the choice of which probe you want to, or JTAG probe you want to use, um, using the embedded USB blaster or the download cable. Um, and then you should be able to find it, so it's connected through USB. It did find it with the browse button. From there, this is the basic setup. I'm going to go ahead and, and save that. Um, but what you, what you need to do next is to tell the, the debugger what you want to do once you connect up. So what I want to do is download a file. So I want to go find the ELF file, or in this case, it's an AXF file, just a different extension. It's an, it's an ELF file. Um, and I'm just going to show you that you can go grab that from one of these projects. Um, so I have the hello. AXF file underneath the debug here. So this is my AXF ELF file. Um, also, it'll automatically save load symbols because uh, you want to do that because it's built with debug symbols, uh, which will help uh, correlate the, the instructions that's running on the CPU to the lines of code in the C code. And you can do a couple of different things from here when you uh, connect up to, to the device. You can say, just connect only, don't download any code, just see what's happening on the device. Um, you can debug from the entry point, or you can debug from symbol, and the uh, the, the default symbol is, is your main, um, main function. But I'm just gonna go from the entry point again. Um, don't have to set anything else here, but you can run some of those um, DS or Python scripts, you know, before you connect or after you connect. So hit apply. And before I hit the debug and go connect, I want to show a couple of other nice features of the uh, Intel, Intel SOC FPGA um, hard processor systems. So if I click the DTSL options edit button, what this will allow you to do is to configure some of the things in the core slide subsystem on this device. Um, and one of the main things I would do want to enable is capturing trace. And you can do a couple different things on this device, which is actually pretty nice. Um, I can use the uh, embedded trace FIFO or the embedded trace router. I'm going to use a FIFO just because it's a simple, uh, simple demo and it doesn't um, 
perturb the system at all. The, the embedded trace router uh, reuses the system DDR or system memory um, and will send trace data um, out to that system bus. It's good to do if you uh, need a little bit extra space, but it does perturb the system a little bit. Uh, to make sure that this is checked, it is. There's nothing we need to do for the ETF. But if you had an ETR, you want to make sure to to configure the uh, start address and the size of that buffer and make sure that it's in a space that um, neither your learn Linux kernel or your bare metal application is using. But we don't need to set this up. Then I just hit apply and OK. And I should hit debug and it should connect up to the device again. Okay, And here we are connected up. Um, I'm just going to step through just a little bit. Oh, I forgot. I didn't set up any breakpoints on this. It actually ran through the whole thing. Um, but here you can see everything it did back in time. I'm going to blow up the uh, the trace capture here a little bit. Um, so you can zoom in on this as well to see actually what happened. And then you can go backwards in time here. This is all time stamped and take a look at all of the instructions that, that happened in this buffer. Um, the other thing you can do here is you can, uh, if this is too deep of a look into what's what's happening, you can actually hit this um, I button and it'll show you all of the function calls uh, instead of the individual instructions. I like to look at this actually first, even though it's not the default view, but this will show you a high level view of what happened. Um, the other thing that I didn't show is you move this around. The good thing about um, using uh, DS and Eclipse is all of these windows are actually um, movable and resizable. For for example, I can you know I can move any of these things around and 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 uh, build up my workspace. But here are the the core um, registers. Now notice I'm only running on one CPU because I didn't. Uh, I didn't run through any startup code to kickstart the second uh, A9 because I built just a simple Hello World application. But if I tried to click on this, this would all be grayed out. The uh, the trace um, will not show. Um, but if there if this core was running, all of this would update in turn. Okay. Um, let me disconnect again real fast. So I showed how to connect up to. Um, to a, uh, a board if you have the board already from scratch. Um, but what if you need to build up a, a real simple Hello, Hello World application uh, from scratch as well and run that? And I'll show you how to do that real quick as well. Um, so basically, I want to do File, New, uh, Project. Uh, I want to select, in this case, C Project. You can also select a C, C you know, C, C slash C plus plus or C plus plus project. I'm just going to stick with C for now. And then uh, what I did to to enable this is I said, uh, you know, create a Hello World ANSI C project. Um, I want to use the latest uh, ARM compiler, which is um, compiler version six. But here you can see I've uh, installed um, the, a, a version 5.06 update 7 from ARM and GCC 12.0. Uh, I'm just going to stick with compiler 6 and give it a name. Hello. Let's call it Hello Intel. Next. This is fine. Won't change any of these other than this was the same message from before. This is a new message just to to show that it is. Um, I don't need to change anything here, but you can select if you want to build, you know, just the release version of the code doesn't have any of the debug symbols or the debug or both. I'm just going to keep it as is. And this is just giving me a summary. Let's finish. And I should have a new Hello Intel uh, project here. And it has created a new Hello Intel uh, dot C uh, file for me as well, and and, and pre-populated my uh, put screen or put string. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, build this project just to make sure that everything's fine. So it here you can see that it ran through um, the ARM compiler, which is ARM Clang for version six, along with ARM Linker, and that's fine. Now. 
this won't run as is um, on this board because, and if you double click on any ELF file or any AXF file, it'll bring up the ELF viewer. Um, what it has done is it has built it in a default way, meaning that it wants to load code at address um, 8, uh, 8,000. Uh, um, so that we know is not a, a place on this particular device that um, that the code can run from. So what I'm going to what I'm going to show you that you need to do, and if you know, if you noticed before, there was a scatter file. This is the linker script in the previous project. Um, you need to have a similar scatter file. I grabbed these from some of the uh, hardware lib examples from Intel. I'm just going to copy that and I'm going to place it into this new project. Uh, paste. So here I have a scatter file. And what this is telling um, the linker to do is instead of building the code at address eight, you know, uh, hex 8000, build it at the location of the on-chip RAM. So we're just going to be running from on-chip RAM. Um, so I have the scatter file, but I need to tell the linker how to use it. So I'm going to click on, right click on the project, click on properties, and go into the settings. Click on the linker. Click on the target, and I'm going to enable tool specific settings. I don't need to do that here, but I need to do the image layout. And I need to point it to the scatter file. And I think what I'm going to do is I know that that's when it's building, I believe it builds one down. So then this one's just called Cyclone 5. Scatter.scat. The other thing we need to do, and I almost forgot about, is um, it, it also, the, the compiler built this in a generic way, not just for the memory layout, but for the architecture. So I need to tell it that this is an A9 instead of a generic, um, you know, ARM V8 64 bit core. And you can do that simply by dropping this down, target CPU, drop down box, and just say this is an A9. Hit apply. Um, yes, we want to take the changes. I'm going to apply and close. And just to be on the safe side, since we're changing everything about this project, I'm going to clean it. We're going to build it. It's built. You can see what the memory, um, how many, what the sections are inside there. But I'm going to go ahead and bring up this AXF file, make sure that it is in the right memory space. Look at the segments. Here you can see the virtual address now is set to um, FFFF and all zeros, which is the on chip RAM. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, now that I have the, built the project, I have the AXF file, I'm going to now take this new debug configuration that we created a few minutes ago and point it to the new, new L file that we just created. So, not this project, but a new one. So underneath debug here, apply, and let's debug it. Okay, we've connected up. You can see what's happening in disassembly here at address FFFF. And bear with me, my, my USB cable is loose, so I, I just knocked it. Let me disconnect and reconnect. So if you see a, a, a DAP error, it's basically it can't unlock the DAP because it can't talk to the cable. So bear with me. Wouldn't, it wouldn't be a live demo without an error or two. So this is good. OK. So I'm going to need to make sure that this cable is stable and I don't hit it with my mouse again. And I to try this again. I'm just going to double click on it. Okay, I'm still getting a few <laughs> errors here. I'm just going to disconnect to this real fast. Bear with me. Um, but this is pretty much close to the end of my demo anyway, but let me just reconnect this and reboot the board.
And here you see I have actually didn't stop at a new boot. It's booting all the way to Linux. But um, we're just two minutes to when we were going to, to open this up to questions anyway. But um, let me just show, um, just let me just reboot this here in the next minute or two. I'm just going to shut it down, give it a, a safe, clean Linux shutdown. I'm going to reboot this. This um, and reconnect. Okay, I'm going to step once just to make sure that everything is set up. We can see everything, and we can show you one command real quick. So since I don't have any, I shouldn't have any breakpoints set. I'm going to use the command window instead of. Um, the, the source code and say B main, it sets a breakpoint at main, run, and then I'll just set another breakpoint with the GUI here. Back to F after this, hit go. And here you can see it's output our, our, our uh, 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 put string as well. And it's our new one, and it's not just the old code. And basically, that's it. We're right on time um, with, the, with the demo. Uh, we can, uh, uh, I think at this point, I'd like to hand this back over to uh, to Susanna for just a minute or two, so, and then we can to uh, give to, and then we can open this up for uh, for for questions and answers. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so this is just a quick rundown of how to ask your question. Um, I'm Susanna. I will relay your question on to Chris uh, when it comes in through chat. Um, so there's two ways to ask your question. First, we welcome you to actually um, unmute and just ask and interact with Chris. Um, and the mute button is up here on your uh, Teams window. <laughs> And um, if you don't want to ask it by voice, um, feel free to ask it by chat. Um, and when it comes in, I'll be asking it to Chris since it's pretty hard to juggle looking at questions um, and demoing your screen at the same time. Because um, I do expect he'll share his screen some more to help answer these. OK, and with that, um, we'll go ahead and get started with the question and answer segment. Um, Chris, feel free to start sharing um, whenever you need to. OK, and um, I'll look out for questions by chat. We've also had some questions come in when you signed up. Uh, you were given the opportunity to ask a question then. So we have some questions that came in through that too. So some of those will be um, thrown in in addition to the ones that I see coming in right now. OK, so Chris, the first question that we got by chat um, was uh, does DS show the microcontroller special function register names um, and the example um, that this um, that that Fadi is looking for is something like SysTick. Oh, I see. So the um, the register names of the um, peripherals around inside of the HPS was that uh, the question? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I did not show that. Um, but let me um, let me connect up to the board again. There's uh, in the registers view there is a um, a set of system uh, peripheral registers that you can uh, you can see as well. So let me bring that up. If you look underneath peripherals, I was only opening the core, which is just the CPU. Let me make sure that it's updating. Yep. If you go into peripherals. Here you can see all the different HPS peripherals. And um, was there a particular one you had in mind that uh, you wanted to see? Um, no, just kind of looking at those. Yeah, that, that's, that, that looks pretty good. Yeah, and what this will do is, um, uh, I guess I don't have everything opened up right now because I haven't run anything to, to, to drive it. But uh, each one of these, it's not just the register name is here in a lot of instances, but the bit fields have been defined as well, and you can get some information um, about this if you hover over these. So yeah, all of the peripherals are here. Um, and how that's done is that we've actually worked with, with Intel. There's like an XML file that comes along with the debug configuration uh, that defines all of these registers. So yeah, these are all there. That's a good question. Okay, 
the next question, and I think you might not be able to do this, but if you're not, maybe you just uh, walk us through how it would be enabled and maybe point us to a place where there is a demo. Um, is, um, is it possible to give a live demo of the Streamline tool? Um, a live demo, not during this session, but yeah, certainly um, I've done several live demos of Streamline in the past. I um, don't have that set up currently with uh, this board and have the, um, so basically what you need to do with, um, with uh, Streamline and what I can do actually is, um, I think I have a couple of embedded slides that I didn't go over just in case we had um, some questions on Streamline. Um, or further questions, um, yeah, let me kind of show this one. Um, so basically what needs to happen with, with Streamline to, to demo it is uh, uh, what we provide is a uh, user space application uh, or a daemon, uh, basically call this the gator daemon that runs on the device that's running Linux. So if you've booted up this device with Linux and we installed the gator daemon uh, on that, what it'll do is it will open up an Ethernet socket that you can then connect up to the, the board. That's why that that Ethernet um, line or, or port that I was showing and the uh, the graphic of the connections is there. Um, it, it basically you can connect up to it and do a live demo that way. But I don't have all of the pieces. I don't have the Gator Demon installed on the device. But there's a few extra set of things that would need to be done. Um, and I'm going to give a little plug here for some of our training. We have a training that goes through how to um, do this on an SSC FPGA, um, all the steps that are specific uh, to our parts. And I just chatted the YouTube link in case anyone is interested in that. OK, um, go on to the next question. Um, so Many customers that use Linux go to manufacturer sites um, such as rocketboards.org for Intel FPGAs um, and build or download pre-compiled images that are bootable for many of the dev kits, um, but they run into issues uh, such as versioning and such. Um, so what benefits does DS bring to the table for these kind of developers? So I guess um, the question is about um what what do you do to make it easy <laughs> what do our um I, I guess i can answer too if you don't know exactly what's built in for the intel fpgas um into our version i can answer some of that but i'll let um, you go first chris yeah i know a little bit um so definitely the uh, the instructions that are rocket boards um it sounds like a, a lot of times it's uh, it runs through using yocto to to build um and uh, you're right. When when anytime you're you're building Linux from scratch, you you, you got to be careful with the the versions of of basically all of the different image files and, and in some cases what versions of the tools are being used there. Um, so what we've we've done a couple different things to help help um, debug this um, with Yocto, and I know in particular with the uh, the the Intel SSC FPGA builds of this, um, it will spit out an image that's called a VM. It's at VM Linux, it ends with an X. Um, that image, along with the Z image or the U image that is used with U boot, we that image is used with DS to to help debug um, those images. As long as you capture that image, when you build the other images that you put on the SD card to boot, and uh, you're not out of sync, then it that that. VM Linux has all of the debug symbols, all the information that DS needs to to debug that. Um, what I, a couple of other things that we have done, and while I'm on this slide too with Streamline, is um, we've actually built Gator in a static way so that it shouldn't rely on many other um, versions of, of let's say extra shared libraries or .so files. So this is meant to to be used on various different versions of um, of the Linux kernel um, out of the box. So it's not relying on. So we've kind of built in all of the library functionality that it needs. So you're not relying on something else that's built and getting out of sync. Uh, the other thing is, and let me go switch over to here. 
there's a couple other views that will help you debug Linux as well. Um, let me see where we are on here. I'm going to to reboot this real fast. Um, to, to Linux, um, I don't know if it's going to have enough time to boot up and 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 I don't know if I'll go through everything, but basically you're you're able to look at remote systems as well. So here it's actually connected to the uh, the board, um, but it hasn't booted up all the way. You can actually see what's on the device inside of um, uh, in inside of um, DS itself. So you don't just see the files, but when you're debugging the Linux kernel, um, you'll see all the processes, the threads. Um, you can set breakpoints inside the kernel and in user space. It's aware of all of that um, as well. So we have the tools. We're actually one of the, the, the first IDEs that enabled Linux debug um, way back in, I, I think, in the, <laughs> before 2010. So, um, so there's a lot of functionality in here um, to, to help debug as well. I don't know if that fully answers the question. I know there were some other things. Maybe Susanna, you had. Uh, yeah, um, Chris, this is, uh, that's me that uh, asked the question for as well. Um, no, that's that's really good. Um, and it would be nice if you could provide some links, maybe to trainings, uh, because I've we've ran into customers that try to, you know, through. Um, issues by booting Linux and they've got versioning issues and they spend a lot of time and it would be nice to point them to your tool if you can you know speed up their development um yeah. as a question Chris like um which of these features that you just showed us uh depend on them having loaded the VM Linux um does any of it show up if you just had Linux running and you weren't quite sure <laughs> what was running. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, all of these features show up. Um, so I'm running Linux right now on the board. Um, I wasn't, uh, I, this demo, I was only gonna do some bare metal, but it, it makes sense. There's, there's lots of users using Linux, so it's it's, it's fine answering those questions as well. Um, so these views show up, um, these remote system views show up um, out of the box. Um, what I can do, and I and I and I know that um, I, what I have is a, is a VM Linux file that's out of sync <laughs> with what's running on the board, and this will show you kind of what what the end users are running into. But this will also try to show you what what is needed as well, um, and I'm I'm fine with that. So let's um, if I have a configuration for for downloading that, might not where I actually don't. So I need a Linux um, configuration to, uh, and I don't have it set up here, unfortunately. But um, so I've done something very similar that your customers are probably run into. We've built um, uh, the the kernel with the the Octo build, um, and then had several different versions of that build sitting around, and the VM Linux file got out of sync. Um, what will happen is you'll be able to step through the code and see code, but it may not be exactly the code that's running because things will move around with each build. Um, the one thing that you need to look for is when you actually load the VM Linux um, command and how you do that. Let me, that's not, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just connect up to this real quick without loading any code. Let's see if we can do that. Uh, debugger, connect only, let's just debug. So you will see some things if you just connect up to the device. This is running, uh, and it's running Linux, and I'm able to actually step through and debug Linux. Um, and here I've actually, um, it is, I have the source code of Linux on my Windows machine, um, and you can actually step through the code. But what is missing is the fact that my VM Linux is out of sync with the, the Octo build. And so what will not show up because of that is there's a couple things. There should be a button here that says OS aware enabled. And when that happens, you can actually right click on here instead of showing or right click on the core itself. Instead of showing the CPU, you should be able to yeah display threads. So what, what happens when you're out of sync is you can still debug, 
but you're not able to see the OS data because it's not aware of the OS. You're not able to see what processes are running, which is very helpful. You're not able to set um, process aware breakpoints. Um, and I use that when I've built some kernel modules in the past where I needed to see what happened when a particular function was called from a particular thread. Um, that functionality is not there. You can still set breakpoints, but it won't be thread aware. Um, and then you, there's some other views in here that aren't shown shown by default, but let me show you how to get into those. If you say preferences, oh, I'm sorry, uh, window show view, this is not everything that you can select. If you do other, um, before I was looking at remote system, so if you just type in remote, if you can spell, um, these will be those remote system uh, connections to a system that's on, on the, uh, you know, through ethernet. Um, what is not shown here is OS data. Um, and since there's no OS, but there's some other tables that will show up here, like um, the call stack and whatnot, this, these views would just not be available. But I can still debug, step through code, and uh, see the assembly instructions, see, um, see all of the registers, both the core and the, the peripherals. But as long as you keep that VM Linux file, and then this was the command here that I ran to and with this debug configuration to to actually load it. Um, it's uh, you just say add simple file VM Linux and you tell it where the offset is. And it's when you're running Linux, it's just offset zero at that point after you boot. And, um, and and basically it will look at this file, look at all of the symbols, match up what's running um, on the board. Um, so you just need to make sure that this VM Linux comes from the same Yocto build that your other your images are coming from. So basically, if you see grayed out stuff, you've got the wrong VM Linux. <laughs> if you see it all enabled, you've got the right one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, basically. Yeah, basically. Okay. That's right. Okay. Um, let me ask some more questions. I think you've actually answered some of these in a roundabout way. Um, so how can DS uh, help you with a Linux driver, um, with Linux driver development? And then also, I, I guess it would be good to touch on application space a little when you answer that. Yeah, yeah. So all of these other features as mentioning kind of play into also developing uh, a Linux driver or a, a kernel space module. Um, the other thing that you can do that's very useful for when you're um, uh, developing that that kernel module is uh, load in the symbols for that module um, so basically this vm linux has all the debug symbols for the kernel itself but if you're augmenting the kernel with a driver or a kernel module um, you need to tell ds what the you know what what's in that what's the debug symbols what you know where's the code for for this um this uh executable as well and you can do that in the uh, the debug configuration this is my Linux debug configuration, and what I've done is I've told it to load add symbol file here. You can actually say something like add symbol file, and you can say my uh, my mod dot ko. So if you're building a, a kernel module, you can actually load the symbols this way with a with a script. Or you can say files instead of what I did before for loading code is um, I let the target application to load in bare metal. But in this case, if you're running code and and just uh, kind of calling it from from Linux, you can you can say um, load simple file from file, and I can go into um, file space and and just pull in that ko. I think like for example. Um, um, the uh, the Intel SOC FPGA examples um, that actually on this uh, this board when you build the root file system with Yocto have lots of .ko files that um, that basically I brought over as well. But you could like add in a kernel module. This is this doesn't this was built by by Intel, but uh, this could be one that you built, a driver that you build, and you can say you want to do lots of them you can bring in several of these and um, here's the dma test one uh, we could see if there's another one here gpio interrupt 
and uh, apply and debug, when you make that connection, it uh, then you can set breakpoints inside of your 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 code um, as well, and it'll know where the source code is for that. So the other thing is is that you you're aware of bringing in um, um, the debug information from your your drivers themselves as well as user space application. The only caveat to that being is that you you need to make sure that when you build your kernel modules and when you build your kernel, there's particular settings for enabling the debug symbols uh, in those. There, and when you're building the kernel, it's inside of the like the, the 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 kernel config or inside the menu config. You can set that. Um, and the if you're building outside of the the Linux tree for your own driver, just make sure that it, that's like the dash g uh, setting is set on the, the GNU compiler when you compile these. Um, and then that'll also enable those. And the same thing goes for user space applications. Um, the other thing, I know we're running a little bit out of time, um, but there are, uh, don't save, okay. Uh, there are lots of examples that come pre-installed with DS that I haven't talked about, as well as we, we touched about some of the Intel uh, hardware lib examples, but there are um, some Linux examples like uh, built in, there's a Hello Linux. This is Linux application. Um, show you how to to debug a user space application, and there's also an example here for Linux kernel debug, um, as well as some streamlined examples. But you can import these in and take a look at them, and they have some example code, uh, how to build, and uh, some real simple readmes. I clicked on that; it, it just brings up a a web page like this. Um, and I'll show you what you could do to build this and how to debug it. But so that's another thing that we have that can help you um, debug is some examples. Okay, um, I think this will be our last question. Um, so does ARM provide any GCC toolchain that is compatible with, with DS? I guess that's kind of a two-part question, actually. <laughs> so yeah. That did, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So that was the thing I mentioned before is that you can plug in several different tool chains. I know we're at time, but I'll try to do this quickly. But you can actually go into Window Preferences, RMDS. There's a whole tool chain section. This is where I've plugged in GCC 12.2.0. But basically, what you need to, all you need to do is click Add, Browse, and then browse to the location of um, your tool chain. So I've downloaded, um, just have it re kind of recognize 12.2. Uh, um, but this is the GNU toolchain for um, for bare metal. You can also have it recognize the ARM Linux EABI, which is for, for Linux. Point it to the bin directory, select the folder, hit next. Uh, it says uh, this one's already here. It's already added. Um, so, you know, I could put in a, a, you know, some other build specifier here, but but basically, that's all you really need to do. It's going to go and try to detect um, the GCC toolchain. You can do the same thing with any of the ARM compilers. If you download those, um, you can connect that. Now, what I didn't show is that you, on our developer.arm.com, I'm going to bring that over as well. Um, if you just click on tools and software and click on compilers and library, um, we have a whole GNU toolchain. Um, area so you can download these as well as the uh, ARM compiler itself um, that comes from ARM that needs a license, but you can download the, the tool chain directly from here. And so this is what I did before the, the demo is just downloaded um, the, the 12.2.0 good tool chain. But that's a good question. Okay, um, so with that, I will uh, take back over and we're, we're past time. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and end it, but let me, ha I have a few closing slides that I need to share. Okay, so thanks everyone for attending. Um, thank you, Chris, for presenting. Um, all of you will soon receive an email with links to a survey, and I'm also gonna chat out um, the link to that survey um, and the record. It will also contain a link to the recording of the session. Um, this Teams meeting will close shortly. Um, and uh, that will be after I go through these few uh, disclaimer slides <laughs> that I need to have for the recording. So thank all thank all of you for attending. Um, and this is pretty much the end, except for those slides that you probably won't want to read.
Okay. Thanks, everyone.